So, um, well, uh, hi, Peter. It's nice to see you and thank you for agreeing um, to talk uh, to us today. Uh, we have here uh, with us uh, a very distinguished person, Professor Peter W. Lisch, Professor of International Business from University of Queensland Business School in Australia, Fellow of the Academy of International Business, Fellow of the Australia and New Zealand International Business Academy, as well as, most importantly, the current president of Academy of International Business. So um, I would like to ask you a few questions first, a few general questions about the international situation, the, the situation in international business, and then more directly to um, uh, Academy of International Business. So uh, what do you think, what are the most important global challenges in international business nowadays? Thank you, uh, Professor Yarosinski. Um, it, it's certainly my pleasure to speak with you. It's my evening here and it'll be your morning. So before I even engage in this discussion, let me again thank you for the wonderful conference you hosted in Warsaw this year for the AIB. Um, I still, at this stage, six months later, hear a lot of positive comments about what a wonderful conference it, it was and what a beautiful city Warsaw was. Is So um, thank you again for hosting the AIB annual conference. So you asked me. Yeah, so you know, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice of you to say that. No, it's, it's been uh, the, it's, the effort of many people, as always. I can appreciate that. So you asked me what important global challenges yeah. there are at the moment in international business. So I'll keep my answers pretty brief as we go through these questions. So I, I, would, I would say that the most important challenges in international business we confront these days are responding to the unexpected. And when I say that, um, I, I do know that there's always been the unexpected, but it seems now that those unexpected events um, have a particular importance in our world of international business. Why? Because for the last couple of decades, we've grown somewhat used to the, the globalised world in which, uh, in which we live. Um, and that globalised world, while it had uncertainties, there was still some reasonable um, norm to what was going on. Since COVID, and some of the geopolitical tensions that we've experienced recently, it seems that that norm of the once global world that we lived in and felt assured in has changed to a degree with you know political nationalism. Um, and we're becoming more more acutely aware of even nat natural disasters. So I think you know, we as individuals and firms have become acutely aware of the unexpected and um, they're having to respond to those unexpected activities. Now, some of these unexpected activities like war and market disruptions, geopolitical tensions and the like, um, while they exist, there are other uncertainties too, one of which is clearly the rapidity with which technology is changing. Um, we're in an era now where, uh, where firms are uh, trying to adjust to some of the recent advances in technology and not quite sure you know, how, how to manage this. And we as individuals are in a similar situation. So there's an acute awareness of the technological revolutions that are going on at the moment. Um, for example, I'll just mention one that um, that that you know I'm aware of, and you probably in Poland will be with your interest in the motor vehicle industry. 
you know, f for a long time, we've had the traditional motor vehicle firms doing what they do, responding to government and, you know, uh, policy initiatives on, say, emissions control and so on, and doing just enough to, uh, to be acceptable in those regimes. Um, with the increased emphasis on climate change and and changing senses around the world, we, we ended up with a newly emergent firm, Tesla, which changed the dominant practice in that whole industry. And now we've got all the legacy motor vehicle firms having to rapidly respond to the new, the new playground that Tesla has set. So that's just one example of how technologies that are entering our sphere of interest these days are motivating the emergence of new firms which are changing the way in which the legacy firms, the existing firms are having to respond. And it's creating significant challenges for those legacy firms. So technology is one of these factors which is creating new uncertainties on how firms would respond. Clearly, the, there are geopolitical tensions too. And, um, and while we've had these in the past, at the moment, they seem to be more long-lived. And I live in a part of the world where the US-China geopolitical tension is affecting us in Australia because r rapidly, China had introduced extreme tariffs on quite a few products being exported from Australia to China. And, and that really did uh, throw exporting firms in those sectors into a spill. Now, that, 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 those, those tariffs have lasted for several years and, and the firms engaged in those sectors have had to find new markets, but that was totally unexpected. I mean, those tariffs were imposed and they were significant, over 200%. So you can imagine how uncompetitive a firm is when it confronts a 200% tariff from a previous regime of no tariff. So there's some of the unexpected. And I think firms these days really have to be attuned to more of those unexpected uncertainties. Okay, so you mentioned several um, different tensions in the environment. <clears throat> How firms may prepare for uh, these tensions, for these crises that uh, that rise around? How to build for them the re resilience for future shocks? So, so clearly that's a very topical issue. Uh, you know, all firms involved in international business are, are tinkering with how to build more resilience into their activities. So the, look, the, the, the most direct response is the one that we, that we hear commentators talk about, about building redundancy into value chains, about um, forming partnerships so that there's some diversification that firms can rely on when things go bad in one part of the world. But, but to me as a generalization, Firms, firms build resilience by having very astute risk management programs. And, and all firms should have risk management programs. But I think um, ever since uh, the, the terrorist attacks in New York, you know, more than a decade ago, the big international firms and the firms that are very active internationally have been acutely aware of risk management and and um, and and what they need do in their own particular firms to accommodate for these um, these uncertainties. So I, I would say, as a generalisation, it's all about risk management. Yes, it can be about building redund uh, re redundancy into firms and capability flexibility and these types of notions, but but all of those become encapsulated in this bigger notion of risk management and so clearly some firms are better than others and um, and even today I mean the firms that I know of that are very active in risk management have 
very solid risk management plans for organised international terrorism, even though we haven't had, you know, major terrorist attacks. But that that doesn't mean it might not happen. So, you know, clearly when these events happen and firms build risk, they must maintain those plans, update them, you know, uh, adopt new technologies when those technologies can can assist. Uh, you've, you've mentioned in, in your uh, communication with me to arrange for this discussion about AI. I, I don't know, but I suspect there's a lot of activity going on in the AI environment to assist firms in, in, um, in, in building strategy for the unexpected. So uh, I guess AI, I suspect AI will be very important in assisting firms in building this resilience. Excellent. Uh, you've mentioned um, sustainability before, uh, talking about an um, international environment. Is sustainability an important direction for international firms now? You, you believe that um, this is what they do they take some lots of actions connected to that but these are these real actions or is it just to satisfy the stakeholders okay professor yarasinski so i'm still a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to talking about sustainability <clears throat> i mean there is the notion of sustainability in that firms sustain their activities for the longer term so I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'll also talk about the more contemporary use of the concept of sustainability. So um, clearly in all of our worlds, there are what we call very long-lived firms. And, you know, this is highlighted in the Japanese Shinose world, where I'm aware of a firm, for example, that's 1,352 years old in Japan. And that firm is still engaged in the same business that it was 1,352 years ago. So clearly these firms, and they're in your countries, they're in Britain, they're in Germany, Spain, Italy. There's not, there's not any in Australia because we, we're not that old. But um, these firms have clearly had to survive through, through many issues. And they've built a, a sustainability that we don't quite understand. I mean, so we could we could probably learn a lot from a closer study of some of those very long lived firms that we tend to cherish in our own environments. Now, when we talk about sustainability in the more contemporary form, yes, sustainability is vital. Um, you did mention, is it just something that firms do to appease stakeholders? Well, certainly firms do take up like the UN SDG goals, uh, the 17 goals, they respond to these because it's it's in their interest, because it's in the interests of their stakeholders. But I, I'm a firm believer now that we've had these long enough to, to observe that firms that do this very well are more competitive than firms that don't do it particularly well. And firms that do do the sustainability goals as the UN mandates them very well, really do improve their profitability by doing so. So yes, I do think it's a particularly important um, a, a domain to be in. And um, particularly too, say from our own Academy of International Business, because our membership did deem that the sustainability domain was vitally important. You might be aware that we have a, a shared interest group, what we call a SIG, a shared interest group in sustainability, where it brings together folk, uh, researchers in IB, who are particularly interested in understanding more about how these goals are impacting firms and how firms are responding to the UN mandates uh, and how it's, it's it's, it's being brought into their strategies and their performance. So yes, it is, it's vitally important. And, and we'll, we'll see more and more scholars in, in the field 
not just IB, but in other fields such as strategic management, organisation studies, management generally, will, will take up the banner in the uh, sustainability domain. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So you, uh, you believe then that, that firms that follow uh, sustainability goals uh, of today's meaning, they will uh, have this uh, sustainable competitive advantage and will stay sustainable in the old meaning for quite a long time. Well, the hope is, yes, if, I mean, it'd be terribly wasteful if, uh, if, if they did invest heavily in it, but their stakeholders are astute also. There are mm -hmm. individual stakeholders, institutional stakeholders, so I think um, I think all stakeholders. Well, I'm confident all stakeholders are bought into this the sustainability domain. So uh, firms are very good at adjusting and responding to um, mandates uh, instituted by governments and transnational organisations. Yes, and I'm confident that uh, in doing so that. Um, that they will lead in their own industry sectors, yes. You have already said that AI may help uh, companies go through crises or prepare better for crises. Do you think that there are any other areas that AI can change the international business? What we should be prepared for? Uh, Prof. Yarosinski, yeah, I'm probably the one of the last people to be able to inform you about uh, AI and what it means, but um, but clearly in in my I've got colleagues on my floor here at the University of Queensland who are who are in the IS area and data analytics and so on, who talk about this stuff all the time, and um, and I, I'm assured I'm assured in reading reports and listening to debate about AI that it is it is revolutionary in our world. Um, why I say that is that if it is these tools that enable us to make better use of all the information that we've got out there in firms, in governments, in institutions, in the environment generally, if AI enables us to make better use of all of that information and detail, to be able to assist us in taking better decisions in the future, then um, AI will be revolutionary because there's a lot of information, there's a lot of data out there. And clearly, as humans, you know, we're subjected to bounded rationalities and bounded reliabilities and so on. And um, it's likely that machines can make better use of a lot of that detail than we as individuals can. So I've got colleagues here who work in the health sector and AI is really assisting in, in, in emergency wards of hospitals and, you know, in, in, in increasing the throughput of, of uh, outpatients as they come into emergency wards. So look, it seems, for example, the medical system is is really on the front foot now in making use of AI. I just clearly marketing, I mean, probably that's the most basic form of the use of AI in the way in which it can uh, par parameterize individual consumers and, um, you know, and develop marketing programs to better meet the needs of consumers. But as I mentioned before, one of the difficult areas I think that individuals and managers do confront is how to manage adversities and so on. If AI can assist with, with that, for example, if it can, can better assist in, in offering um, likelihoods of terrorist attacks or, or um, major global disruption, say in financial markets and so on, then clearly that will revolutionise what's going on. I mean, to most of us, international financial markets are... Uh, you know, are an unknown, but but clearly there's a lot of data there, and a lot of it's uh, and a lot of it's repetitive, and and there's probably too much for individuals to uh, process. But but if AI can do a lot of that, and and even you know 
subject to the limitations of of machine learning and so on if it, if the likelihoods of of certain events happening in the future can be predicted with better um, better skills then maybe some of the disasters that we confront in financial markets and global trade problems maybe some of the information impossibilities that we learn about in global value chains might be ameliorated for example you know, we know that in complex global value chains, um, there are multi-tiered suppliers. So the focal firm will never know exactly what's going on in a complex global value chain with all of its suppliers, probably third and fourth tier suppliers in some stages. But but if 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 AI can assist in bringing a lot of that detail from all of those multi-levels within the supplier networks and global value chains to the focal firm, then clearly that will improve the efficiency and and um, and probably assist in the development of firms way down in those lower tiers in the global value chains. So uh, that's certainly something that IB people um, are likely to take an increased interest in over time. And it all ties back to information impossibilities. You know, um, if machine learning and AI can ameliorate some of those problems, then we'll all be the better for it. I've seen some forecasts, and I, you know, I won't relay where they're from, but but some of the predictions on how the astute use of AI can increase global GDP are, are quite amazing. Um, you know, uh, some of these numbers. Um, reflect what people were saying when uh, the world was moving to uh, more widespread, you know, tariff reductions and so on. So, I mean, for somebody like myself, it's wait and see. But clearly, um, here's, a, here's a role for interdisciplinarity between IB and the smart people in the data analytics and data sciences and so on. Uh, that's somewhere where we can collaborate more um, more productively. But AI, yep, it, it could well be revolutionary. Yeah, so it seems that AI and other new digital technologies will provide a lot of opportunities for, for companies, for individuals in the future. So from what you have said so far, uh, it looks like um, um, that international business is quite an interesting area of research. Could you tell us what are the new trends and research directions in international business? So uh, uh, at the outset, I'll, I'll, I'll be abstract on this. So the new directions in IB research are along several dimensions, one of which is um, IB is becoming more receptive to a wider range of research methods. So historically, IB research grew out of economics research, I suppose, and some of the political sciences and sociology. But today there are phenomenal developments in research methods. And you'll hear a lot in IB about, and, and in JIBS and our main journals, that these journals are more receptive to um, research methods pluralism. So, so there are great opportunities for smart minds who use different research methods to bring um, different understandings to existing and new research topics. So that's one of the developments. Another that we don't talk about, but some of us think a little bit about, is that there are different theorizing styles. We in IB are, are wedded to some very traditional theorizing styles, but in some of the other areas in organization studies and org theory and so on, there are different views about how one might be able to theorize. So I think we'll see more over time being said about uh, different theorizing styles, which might, it's not just qualitative and quantitative uh, in terms of methods, 
there's different ways of thinking about how we explain things. So I think there'll be more about different ways of theorizing. Then when we get to particular topics, for example, um, clearly um, the international arena is, is rich with topics. Like I mentioned one a minute ago, I mean, some of us, some of us are wedded to the notion that a lot of ideas about the way in which international production is organised, well, clearly that's changing. Um, and while the global value chain is not particularly new, uh, the way in which it's going to be reconstrued with changes in technology and developments in, say, even the SDG goals, for example, might change the way in which firms start to reorganise their global value chains to adhere more to some of these mandates. So, you know, global value chains, we, we know a bit about global value chains, but we don't know a lot. Other fields are working in the area too, supply chain management, some economics, some of the, uh, the, uh, the political economy people work in the area. But we as IB people should be strongly theorising the global value chain more than we do. We need developments like, like the Buckley and Casson developments in the early 1970s, which brought on internalization theory to explain the nature of the MNE. We need to shift the unit of analysis in IB, at least in some areas, away from the firm to something more grandiose, such as the global value chain. That would bring interesting developments. And clearly, there are a lot of, um, let me say, more junior academics in IB who are bringing their own particular interests into the field, whether that be in the more sociologic aspects relating to um, sustainability goals and so on. But that's becoming really important in IB. The fact that the fact that we build or we we bring on shared interest groups in the Academy of International Business illustrates the fact that we are committed to, in IB, in the AIB, to moving with developments in these areas, sustainability, digitalization. Uh, we've got a new digitalization shared interest group. And clearly, um, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't have a digitalization shared interest group. And it will be really interesting to see what bright ideas come out of that shared interest group. Even in research methods, and we've got that shared interest group in research methods, maybe it could be an IB person that brings a new uh, research methodology into the scholarly arena. That would be wonderful. So, um, so IB is, um, is rich with, with prospects, with possibilities. You know, still the traditional parts of IB are very important because firms are engaging in joint ventures, firms are engaging in franchising, firms are engaging in FDI. But then there are a lot of aspects to the way in which that engagement is happening and how that international transaction is transacting is happening that we still are just at the very ground level in uncovering. So I would say that the field is rich with untapped potential. Perfect. Uh, so maybe a little bit of advice to young academics, uh, if you could tell us why, why is it worth to be an IB researcher? What would you say on that? So uh, I could spend a little bit of time relaying why I joined IB, because my PhD mm. is in economics. and. Um, and, and why I joined uh, IB was that I'd written my PhD in a general area that that was in the, I guess you'd say in the in the field in the domain of imperfections in international markets, and at the time economics wasn't interested in that because it was interested in competitive international markets, and I find I found a ready home in IB because basically international business. All international business is, well, nearly all international business is conducted in, in imperfect international markets. So uh, 
And clearly that was part of the genesis of internalization theory. But those imperfections still exist and probably they're becoming more acute, even though we've had um, more markets being introduced and, and some of the institutional imperfections such as tariffs and, and quotas and so on have been reduced, if not eliminated. Clearly there are imperfections being introduced all the time um, with changes in technology, um, geopolitical interventions and so on. So, so as, as a researcher, um, as a young researcher, wh wh why, why be an IB? I think IB, well, it's been, the field has been around for over 60 years. I, it, in my eyes, it's still a very young field. It's a very young field because, because the whole context continues to change. And we go through eras where that change becomes more acute. And the phenomena that we observe going on in the world um, become more um, become more manifestly important. And IB is a phenomenological field, right? That's something um, that, that, that we don't always remind ourselves. It's a phenomenological field. So it grew out of observations at the time about phenomena that weren't being explained by the existing disciplines. It's, it's still a phenomenological field. And there are phenomena that are happening in the international business domain that require explanation. And we in, and that's our role in academe. As a young researcher in, in academe, we, we have a societal mandate to write theory, to advance theory. There is no other group in society with that mandate to develop and to advance theory. Consultants don't do that for example, but but that's the role of scholars. So I would say to a young IB researcher, think of yourself as a scholar. Think of yourself in that privileged position in a very rich research context where there's a lot happening, where there are a lot of phenomena that require explanation, where those phenomena are impacting the way in which firms internationally engage in exchange and how individuals in our world respond to the way in which our international firms are conducting themselves. And, and it's, this is our domain. And I believe there will probably always be emerging phenomena that an international business scholar can take an interest in. So this is our role, this is our societal role um, and, and we should cherish it. As scholars, you know, we should be taking a stronger interest in theory and, and, um, and, and working towards advancing the, th the theories that we observe in IB. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering, uh, the many researchers in in Poland and um, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe that, that I observed that do research and they, they start research in the area of international business, but sometimes somehow do not get through with their interesting results that with the, the interesting findings. What, what would your advice be how to best disseminate uh, their research? Um, this is a really critical issue, isn't it? Because um, for example, in our Academy Academy of International Business, there are about 3,600 members. But we know for a fact that there are multiple times that number teaching international business of some sort or the other around the world. And we never we never see these people. And, and probably a lot of them are doing some forms of research in international business issues, most of which we will never ever see. So it's a little bit like us writing PhDs. You know, in the past, we'd write a PhD, it would sit on a shelf in a library, and unless, unless we published from that PhD in the international journals, um, nobody ever knew about that, that PhD. I suspect today there are a lot more PhDs sitting in computer files and disks and 
and all around the world that were, you know, the findings of research undertaken will never be seen. Now, I'll have to move again just to keep this light on. This is the environmental consciousness of our university, yeah. Professor Yarosinski. So, yeah, uh, sustainability. We, sustainability, yes. So, so it's very wasteful, isn't it? Doing research consumes a lot of time. It consumes organisational resources. It consumes intellect, intellect that's very valuable. And um, unless that research uh, is challenged and developed further and enters the international debate and therefore ultimately could end up in international publications, um, it's just a massive waste to society. And in our privileged position as scholars, um, we should be very mindful of that. I mean, society can do with a lot more research, a lot more quality research. So for young scholars in, in your part of the world, just as in my part of the world, why should they disseminate research? Well, there, there are multiple reasons, one of which relates to the, the reasons for joining academies and becoming participant in academy activities like shared interest groups and regional regional chapters. You know, we as individuals derive a lot of our, our being from forming what I'll call tribes, you know, groups of like-minded individuals who live and learn and grow from those interactions between one another. As young researchers in your part of the world, in any part of the world, the dissemination of research is what, what brings them into the mindsets and the visions of others who can work with them and develop those ideas into, into possibly even more productive research agendas. So... Um, what, what would be the best way to de disseminate? Okay. Research? So the best way to disseminate research, firstly, is to be part of an academy and to be part of what we call shared interest groups or chapters. In other words, coalitions of like-minded people. So without joining academies, we're just, you know, dot points in a big world and, um, and it's pretty hard to, it's very difficult to make connections in that world. If we join academies, we have a mindset that we do want to develop our ideas. We do want to share our ideas because that's part of being in that tribe. And by being in that tribe, others get to know the individual and the individual gets to know others who share those interests and who can develop them further. So I would use an expression like we all, we in academe, live in a world of the market for ideas. That's the market in which we live. You know, in academia, we're seeding ideas constantly, continually, and some of those ideas become very strong and develop into theoretical uh, developments and that could lead to a new school of thought in the field. So, in, in that we all exist in this market for ideas, I believe that that firstly there's there's a joy to the individual of knowing that we belong to a group. There's a joy of knowing. There's a joy of knowing something that other people don't know. That is a theoretical development or an empirical outcome or something. But if we have that development, there is also a joy of sharing it with others to see how how strong that idea really is. Unless we share it, we never learn whether there is a demand for your particular idea. And that's part of the, the challenge that in, acad in, in academe we enjoy by putting ideas forward and engaging in debate to, to challenge whether our ideas have got strong foundations. So there's a, there's, 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 in this market for ideas, it's important to be known in that market, 
and you won't ever be known unless you're bringing your ideas into that market. And there's the importance of knowing what is happening in that market to help you develop those ideas and help you develop new ideas or newly emerging themes and so on. So as, as an economist originally, I guess it all what I'm saying is it all relates to the notion of markets. We all exist in markets. In academe, it's a market for ideas. And that's what we as academics create. And unless we bring those ideas to that market, we will never know how strong or how those ideas could be developed further into strong theoretical developments. It could be. You, there could be. There, there could well be young academics in, in, in your Eastern and Central European context who become the new theoreticians in the area of IB. But unless they join an academy, unless they participate in your local chapters, present at conferences, um, and then take those presentations into, you know, professionally scripted journal articles and submit to journals, um, we will never know whether you've got those theoreticians in your part of the world. So that, 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 that's, that's my response to the idea of dissemination of ideas. Okay, very, very interesting approach to treat uh, uh, these discussions as a market of ideas. I, I've never mm -hmm. thought about this before in, in, that, in that way. So uh, one of the best opportunities to share the ideas is, I think, the um, conference conferences that that we have. And you've been so nice to mention the AIB annual conference in in Warsaw that happened last uh, last July, and uh, the coming one is going to be in Seoul. So in Warsaw, we had uh, lots of like new people in in the conference, new researchers. Uh, uh, how to encourage them to participate in the following conferences in Seoul and, and other conferences? So how, to, how would you describe the value in these conferences to them? Yeah, well, it, it, it very much, um, a response very much flows onto the question you previously asked about mm -hmm. dissemination of ideas. So, about a decade ago in the Academy of International Business, the decision, a decision was taken to operate the Academy more like a multinational enterprise. In other words, to geographically diversify and to product diversify. And that's why we ended up with regional chapters. And that's why we ended up with shared interest groups. So we operate basically in the Academy of International Business, much as a traditional multinational would. Now, why, why geographically diversify? Geographically diversification, geographic diversification is important because at the outset, our parts of the world have, have local differences. So for example, in the last month, I've been to the AIB Oceana chapter conference, which was held here in Australia. So that brings people in to a local conference from Australia, New Zealand and the small Pacific Island nations. Now, an innovation this year in that chapter was to bring the small Pacific Island nations into it. Now, small Pacific Island nations might not be important to Central and Eastern Europe, but they're very important in this part of the world because their countries are going underwater some of those small island nations uh, won't exist at some stage in the future because, for example, Tuvalu has an average above sea level of 1.8 metres. So you can imagine how threatened people who live in Tuvalu are when they're only 1.8 metres on average above sea level. So for our part of the world, what goes on in the rest of the world that impacts you know, glo glo um, you know, rising sea levels and climate change is very, very important. But but probably possibly those people wouldn't get a voice in in a conference in another part of the world. But 
but it's now our role in the AIB Oceana to assist those small island nations get a bigger voice in the world scheme of things. After I went to that conference, I went to the AIB Asia Pacific Conference in Bangkok, which is a chapter of all the East Asian economies, Korea, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, and Taiwan, and so on, the Philippines. Now, that's a hugely diverse group of countries, but each of those countries has a representative on the board of that chapter, and they bring particular interests from their own countries, and they talk to each other. Some of those nations historically have not got on well together, but through the AIB Asia Pacific chapter, they have a common interest. They're interested in international business. And through that common interest, it builds relationships between populations who, who might not normally have enjoyed each other's company as much. So the AIB, through its regional chapters, can be a, a strong force and a growing force to work with populations who have a common interest in international business research and teaching, for example, to, uh, to do joint activities. So, um, yeah, the, why, 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 why should we as individuals patronize our annual conference? Well, the annual conference is a big get together of all of those peoples from their, their specific individual chapters. And it gives, it gives chapter members from different parts of the world a stronger idea, a firmer idea of what's going on in other parts of the world by talking to, by listening to, by engaging in discussion, by participating in workshops for these shared interest groups and so on, for example. So, look, I mean, historically, I first, <laughs> it's interesting, but the very first AIB conference I ever went to in my career happened to be in Seoul in the mid-1990s. Uh, so here we are, we're going back there again. <clears throat> and it was, it was being at that conference that I saw some of the names of individuals who I was just becoming familiar with in the in the literature, for example, in Jibs and Journal of World Business and so on, and and it was it was it was comforting to me to appreciate that some of these big names in the field were still presenting papers and engaging in the discussion and questioning that went on for you know new members of the AIB like myself at the time, so. I think it's just, again, it's part of this belonging to a tribe, but that's a big tribe. And you see you see um, names from, from other parts of the world that you would not normally see. So, I mean, I, I've heard it said at some stage that, um, that with, we live in a world with lots of globalizing tools and we've got a lot of communication. We can sit here, I can sit at my desk here at the University of Queensland in St. Lucia in Brisbane in Australia and work away toying with a research idea in an academic, um, academic manuscript. But until I actually physically meet with the people that I'm writing with uh, or and, and the audience that I'm trying to write that paper for, it doesn't have quite the same meaning as being in, in person. So it's a bit like we live in a world with globalizing tools, but we still have a stone age brain. We still have a brain and a mentality that we like to associate with like-minded individuals. And in our field, those like-minded individuals are IB scholars. And um, and to me, that's one of the real attributes of going to the annual conference. My Stone Age brain um, is being rewarded because at least I'm, I'm now meeting with like-minded people who talk a similar language in the concepts and, and theories in international business and the hot topics of the day. And it, it, it makes me feel good. No, it's, it's a nice feeling. 
but it's a very lonely feeling sitting at my desk here in splendid isolation from the rest of the world in IB trying to thrash out ideas on my computer. You know, we all learned that during COVID, I think, um, uh, Merrick, that, that um, yes, we could get our work done, but it wasn't overly pleasurable until we started to meet in person. And I think, and I'm confident that's one of the big um, advantages that you had in Warsaw at the AIB annual conference that a lot of people who'd been locked down in different parts of the world could finally come together and realize that, gee, belonging to an academy, sharing research ideas in this marketplace for ideas is, um, is something to be cherished. And um, and life life as a scholar can be uh, rewarding again. So yeah, I think Seoul will be a wonderful place for people with like-minded interests to come together, and we'll see a, another part of the world that is very different from uh, from Warsaw and from other parts of the world that we've been to in the last few years. But it's a part of the world we hear a lot about because it's a very dynamic economy. So, um, yeah, academy membership is 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 really worthwhile. It's relatively costless, and we derive, I think, as we derive phenomenal benefits, and we can deliver as individuals a lot to our academy by joining through that association. Yes, uh, I can only agree with you. Uh, so, um, well, we are having very interesting conversation, but time flies by very quickly. So maybe concluding, is there any message that you would like to share with us, with our audience at SGH and other audiences that will hear us uh, as a president of Academy of International Business? A lot has been already said, but maybe some concluding message. I think Professor Yarosinski, my final message would be is this. After being in Poland last year, a country that I've never visited before I've been around it and um, and and past it and over it, but I've never actually been in Poland. I mean, I think everyone who went to Poland was really impressed with the way in which Poland has progressed its, you know, its economy and its social life, and and um, and just the quality of life, and 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 we try to take our AIB annual conference into parts of the world that leave memories for people, and that bring people into the academy from those parts who might not normally have been there. So, in my final message, I'll, I'll say the lessons that you learn and that I learn, and that probably most people, if not all people who went to the conference that you hosted have learned, will be shared again in Seoul. Similar things will happen. We'll all experience the importance of being in a tribe, listening to presentations and discussions on topics that impact our IB domain. And we'll all feel that, I think it will it builds our aspirations on what we can next achieve as individuals, you know, in this big world of the market for ideas. So I'll, I'll finish on that, that, um, that what we all learn, you and I and others in Poland, will all learn again, but in a very different context in Seoul. And then in a year after Seoul, we'll do the same in a very different part of the world. And it just builds us as scholars in our field, our, cho our chosen field of international business. It's a lifetime learning. Thank you, Professor Lisch, uh, for the time with us, uh, for sharing this beautiful afternoon that you have um, with us a little bit. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and I hope to see you at the next uh, AIB conference in Seoul. Merrick, you certainly will see me there, and I'll be looking out for you too. So thank you very thanks much. all for listening and thank you for hosting this. I will uh, stop.